Welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Creeden, and are you guys enjoying yourselves here today? This is a first-class event, isn't it? Let's, let's just give it up for all to him, right? I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and being a part of this presentation. Um, we are housekeeping, by housekeeping, we're going to be two hours. And I get it, we just had a lovely lunch. So that means if you need to use the restroom at some point, quietly go out there and watch the door. It can be a little bit noisy, if you please. Um, we're going to go for an hour and a half. The old adage is if I talk fast, you have to listen fast. Okay? We've got a lot of material I want to try to cover. Uh, I'm going to do my best. I do not know all the answers. I'll do my best to tell you what I do know. Um, at about 1.30, hour and a half into this, excuse me, an hour and a half into this, uh, 2.30, um, we're going to try to pull our application engineer up here. Uh, Chris Carlson is joining me. Where's Chris sit, sitting at? He's right back in the back. This is nice. We truly get one of the best AEs, a corporate AE right out of the San Diego area. And we're going to keep it kind of loose. We're, we're, we, Chris and I discussed this. We're not going to try to do something really canned that would, you know, try to show you how to do something. We want to make it somewhat responsive if we can show you some features in, in there and maybe some of the Q&A during that time. So if you're thinking of some questions, write them down. I mean, I'll try to ask some along the way because that's when the thought process happens. You won't queue them all up. Um, but my answers will be brief. And um, Rachel, where's Rachel at? <coughs> Rachel's right there. She, she's going to have tickets, OK? So remember, the more questions you ask, Limit to, um, you, I'm kidding. <laughs> you get a ticket and there's some good raffle prizes from that, so you wanna be involved. Am I inside a camera window? I think so, because they're gonna film this. So you guys are gonna be on the demo album. It's a live album, so um, awesome. This is my bio. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on here. Um, MIT, I'm a master instructor for IPC. I'm a CID plus. Is there any other CIDs in the room? Woohoo! Shout out. Well done. Um, I got to be a primary contributor on that curriculum. Um, I was the founder of San Diego PCB Designs. They're actually showing down here. Um, I sold that company uh, two and a half years ago. And I'll always be associated with it. Um, I've actually somewhat formed a link between them and my new employer. Um, I started this year working at Inselectro. Okay? Inselectro is the nation's uh, premier distributor for laminate materials. Uh, Isola, DuPont, uh, the Ormet uh, centered vias. Uh, so we're going to talk a handful of those things, um, but not exclusively on those product lines. Um, again, I teach the IPC, through IPC the CID um, curriculum. Um, I'm with the IPC Designers Council, an executive board member, blah, 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 blah. The bottom thing is to me always the most important. Um, I love this industry. This industry has been good to me, okay? I enjoy it. I love that puzzle solve. And I used to do stand-up comedy, so I kind of enjoy being up here, you know? I usually say, hello, my name is Nervous, and I'm a little bit Mike. But anyway, um, with that... If you've ever seen one of my presentations, you're going to almost always see this. This slide is a pictorial of what was going to, is in the process of being added to the IPC 2200 series of design specifications. Um, essentially, it is a challenge to all of us who come from many different walks of life. So this is my chance to query you guys a little bit. Who here works for a fabricator? We have. Okay, cool. We got a couple here. And um, as a matter of fact, we have a sponsor down there, Sierra Circuits. Um, anybody here work in the materials science? Okay, I see one or two hands here. I think Megan was in the room at some point, right? Nice, there she is. Um, who here works for an assembler? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, we got another one out there. Cool. We got another one there. Nice. Um, okay, designing circuits. You say design, a lot of times when I do this, I'm going to qualify this one. Um, who does layout exclusively? I'm one of those guys, okay? 
Who here does doubly e schematic drawing exclusively? You're not doing the layout. You, you outsource it or have a layout team. Who, or who, yeah. <laughs> who here is doing the double E and the layout also? Bam, exactly what I expected. Welcome audience, audi uh, Altium audience, okay? You want to know one of the biggest secrets, in my opinion, why Altium is successful? It's the marketing to you guys. You are the new generation of, of people doing layout, okay? Um, not exclusively, but you're tr truly the largest raise of hands, okay? Whoever you are doing layout, you need to stop thinking compartmentally. That's what this, this is talking about. You'll see this slide twice. Because if you're just a layout person and you're solving a 5,000 part board with 50,000 vias on 18 layers or 72 layers, that's a puzzle to be solved. Okay, if you're doing a placement, that's a puzzle to be solved. If you're master of a CAD tool, okay, I mean, I've been, someone asked me, how long have you been an Altium user? I was an Altium purchaser, okay, because I owned a company since like summer 06, okay, so meaning that there's a handful of people who's been using Altium 10 years or more, okay? These are CAD tool experts. You should actually be checking their names because we want to pool together and getting together in an event like this is pooling that kind of expertise. You gain expertise from the people sitting next to you. Okay, that's part of that layout solvability. Okay, are you proficient with your CAD tool? Swinging around this next perspective is solving. Okay, so DFS. If I say DFM, everyone kind of heard that before, but DFS is that top one. The DFP is the performance. If you listened to Dr. Eric this morning, if you came yesterday to Rick Hartley's class, who attended Rick's class yesterday? I did. <laughs> <It's> questionable. <laughs> um, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count how many times I've sat through one of their classes and I add 5% to my knowledge base and I'm up to about 20 after 20 years. Um, slow learner. Um, you must, today's designer must be thinking of the performance. The um, energy lives where? Per, per Rick's expression, it lives in the? In the fields, all right. They were actually paying attention and so, yeah. Um, and so where does the field exist? And the materials, that's why the clown is at the front of the stage here. All right, um, I'm gonna talk to you about materials and where those fields live in there and how they perform. So that is much of the performance. Now that is not just signal integrity, it's also the EMI, EMC. You know, what type of emissions and electromagnetic theory can do to the outside world or what can the outside world do to me? Power delivery. We're going to see, and I will repeat this sentence probably, as you get into higher speed, the current requirements and the power delivery is just going off the charts. It's a new ball game, and you must be paying attention to the power delivery. And along with power always comes thermal. Is heat our friend? No, heat is not our friend at all. And so the thermal um, aspect of that performance um, affects so many things, so many things. Um, the third thing, the DFX, X being a term used for anything that affects your production yield, the reliability, the quality, okay? You buy a cheap board, to quote Rick, price is what you pay up front, but cost is what you're gonna pay in the long run. And most of us, you're prototyping here in the States, and you're building offshore, if you're building high volume, if you're mid-level, maybe you're here, I and mean, that's kind of the demographics. Um, you should be prototyping with the best quality fabrication shop you can, okay? Because you want to debug your circuit, not a PCB fabricator, okay? The assembler essentially has, it's a two-layer board to an assembler. <laughs> There's the top side and the bottom side. That's the, from assembler's perspective. But from the fabrication standpoint, anything that's going to affect your yield, um, reliability, will lower the cost, okay? 
So um, with that, uh, the goal is to make revision one work. Wasn't a lot of bling to that, but there you have it. That was bling. Um, okay, so moving right into what we're going to be talking about today, um, all you have to do is say 5G and you can get a speaking gig. And I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that was fun to say anyway. Um, so remember I said 43 years of doing this? Um, I actually have in my collection of cell phones in the garage, being an ex-stand-up comedy, I used, I used to actually have a, a trove of, of theater props, and all my phones are in there until my kids started using them on, on you know, Halloween costumes, but I designed a 900 megahertz cell phone. Okay, you live in San Diego, it's Telecom Valley. Um, I designed the very first digital pager. It was an IBM ThinkPad. It was put into a laptop, it was a modem. Um, so the first one, truly cellular phones, and then we had basically some, you know, digital happening there. And then the first mobile one is the 3G, and we actually started getting some internet on there. And do we, anybody like 3G right now? No, you see 3G, you're like, oh, forget it. And, and the 4G, we truly started getting some live streaming, okay? But does anybody like, no, it's buffering. Okay, and so what 5G is going to be doing, it's an order of magnitude, that sounds like the third time I've heard that phrase used in the last two days, of improvement. Okay, one of the terms used is MIMO, the multiple input, multiple output. Think of it in terms, and I heard somebody on, uh, I heard on the internet, so it must be true, um, of, a, of a road, a two-lane road, okay? And then all of a sudden you came to California and it's a five-lane freeway going two ways, right? But then you maybe move to New York and there's a subway underneath it. And of course there's air traffic above it. And the city of tomorrow will have drones and stuff flying in space. That's a description of 5G. It's going to be much broader, much faster, and multi-levels to communication. And it's going to truly transform our industry. And we designing the circuit boards are going to have to adapt to that. And it will be a game changer. It truly will be a game changer for us. I'm going to talk about some of that in the next handful of slides. Um, oh, there's more bling popping up there. Yeah. Um, so when you look at a slide like this, the 5G stands for the fifth generation of uh, the wireless technology. And because everything is, for the most part, traveling over the internet, that's why it's uh, going to affect all aspects, whether or not you're in mill aero, you know, commercial or whatever. Um, but it needs to be robust. It needs to be fast, quicker downloads. I mean, you guys get all of this, what it's supposed to do. But the concept, and it shows you how we live, work, and play, you know, anything from smart vehicles to, you know, s smart clothing to smart household, um, medical, you name it it's going to have this kind of application simply because I can communicate a wide band of data very fast. Okay, that's why it'll become ubiquitous everywhere. Okay, so a handful of things right there. Find maybe where you belong or give me another bullet and I'll add it. Um, I put this slide up here because I want you to read every line on it. No, no, I put it up there because it's colorful. <laughs> it, essentially is the United States frequency allocation chart. You go to almost every other country and they've got their own color code up there, okay? Kind of looks like their flag maybe, I don't know. Um, essentially, of late, they have made a handful of frequency allocations, okay? The millimeter wave, okay? Microwave is kind of a looser term, but the millimeter wave specifically, I'll, I'll cover it in a second. Um, but there's new allocations where it's gonna, the 5G will perform in, okay? So a microwave is a form of electromagnetic radiation. Occasionally I'll read these definitions um, with wavelengths ranging from about one meter uh, to one millimeter, okay? With frequencies 300 up to three, 300 gigahertz, gigahertz. So it's a looser definition, okay? They're following a line of sight. That's an important point I want you to take in. They're limited with effective ranges. Okay, how far can they go? And Essentially, the millimeter wave is more specifically talking about the wave 
operating with, um, in the millimeter wavelength, okay? So a wavelength is a, is a spatial period of a periodic wave, the distance over which wave shape repeats, okay? So it's a cycle. We're kind of familiar with this, but I'm describing at this point the RF portion of a wave. Here's a handful of the different frequencies. I mean, take it all the way back to AM radio, FM radio, right, and moving on up. Um, but what we're talking about here is in this extremely high frequency right here, this 30 gigahertz to 300, okay, is where that millimeter 5G radio wave will exist. And at first it's going to exist. I've heard, and the numbers will always change, but it'll come in three different uh, waves at first, uh, or bandwidths. So we'll see how that progresses. So a millimeter wave band is considered unsuitable for mobile communications, mainly due, because it's high loss, propagation issues. Um, these concerns have been solved with the development of phased array, okay? Or beam steering or beam forming antennas. So I, I drew up a couple of pictures that I've seen out here. And so I encourage you to go uh, find Mr. Wikipedia yourself. And this one in particular, as it spins around this, each one of these lines will broadcast out. So it gives you ability, if you've ever looked at how a, an antenna wave projects, okay, this shows you, and the same thing with this one, if you actually looked at this one when it's dynamically operating, um, it made this file like about 80 megabytes to have that on there, so I didn't. But essentially, it's multiple points gonna be pushing out, and when it sees an obstruction, it's communicating to the next wave, okay? So just to give you a rough idea how that's working, um, but they're getting around the obstacle or, or the ability of getting around obstacles, okay? Um, you've been in places where reception's not as good, um, and this will need to perform on cars, on aircraft, um, ships, you name it. So there's gonna be quite a bit that that's gonna do. So this kind of shows you that RF signals, while generated on our boards, they're taken off by an antenna, okay? A connector used between the boards, and again, they don't always make it through the hill, so the use of cellular repeaters, there's a really nice cellular repeater company here in San Diego called Nextivity, um, but they, they use onboard antennas or external antennas, but the difference between high-speed signal communicate between devices on the board, and they need to stay on the board. So when we hear frequencies, we, we as designers tend to think of what's on our board. Um, and then when we hear frequencies from RF, they're not a, our concern because once they leave our board, okay? So this is an important sense here that the high speed design and RF frequencies operations and data bandwidth signals are on the board and RF signals are over the air and handled with different parameters and methods. So. Um, Someone says 100 gigahertz on the board versus 100 gigahertz in RF. It's kind of two different domains we're talking about, and we're going to look at that somewhat. So when we get onto our board and we're talking about high-speed designs, um, here's a couple of the protocols that you guys have seen or probably working on. Anybody doing the PCI Express? Yeah, three, four, four, four. Five is here coming. I'm curious if anybody would raise their hand on that one. Um, but so you're really looking at a couple of things of how much data can I pass and how quickly can I pass it, okay? Um, and a lot of times it's accumulation of multiple channels doing this, okay? So for example, a high-speed digital 32 gigabits per lane in the PC uh, Express 5 delivers 64 channels over 16 lanes in each direction for a total bandwidth, uh, link bandwidth of 128. So when you start to see some of these numbers, you, you kind of get lost in that. And unless you're actually designing the architecture of this, I'm gonna encourage you, don't worry about it, okay? What you really wanna worry about is your frequency of operation and what kind of rise time is on your board. We'll cover that a little bit later. And you've also probably heard it. Um, I'm not gonna cover it into the depth it was covered earlier. Um, so whenever I see this, because I now work um, representing this. I'm going to occasionally tell you about some of the materials I have. So is this cheesy sales part of it? You betcha. I don't care. Um, it's technically appropriate. That's why I'm telling you. Okay. So for 
particular, Isola has a product called Tachyon 100G. It's rated for the 100 gigahertz, okay, with a DK of 3.02. I mean, come on, that's off the charts good. And uh, the loss of 0 0.0017, that's a phenomenal number. If you want to compare it, and we, I have some comparison later on, it's typically a spread weave. So we're going to talk about what weave looks like and how to deal with it. Also, the T sub G. So these are all different performance factors, both physical and electrical, that how this material will perform and support your design. The T sub G essentially is when the resin goes liquid. And for high layer count boards, having that higher T sub G basically gives you stability a little bit longer in the lamination cycle. So that's a nice advantage. Um, the T sub D is at what point, if I've overheated this with too many lamination cycles, would the material decompose? Okay, so if you're truly doing a, an HDI where you have five of these lamination, you know, a four N4, at some point you're pushing a T sub D number, okay? Um, along with Astra is the other one I'm talking about, and I'm just trying to cut to the chase to show what a real high speed solution is. Astra is very similar to the Tachyon material with these DKs of 3.02, which is the equivalent of using any of the P PTF, uh, PFTE type materials, but I'm going to show you some advantages to it. The interesting part of using Astra is it's almost all the resin, okay, very thin weave in there, and I'll show you why that's important later, okay? But in understanding gigahertz, it's an operational switching frequency, okay, which will affect your rise time, and your rise time tells you how that signal is going to try to make it through your board, okay? The gigabits per lane is the amount of data or multiple lanes of data, and typically it's a bi-directional type thing, okay? So, I mentioned before, electrical and physical performance uh, properties, um, the low dielectric constants, the first parameter typically people look for when they're thinking about materials. And what I encourage you to do a lot of times is just plug in different dielectric constants, see what your results are, okay? And there's a lot of different impedance calculators out there, and I encourage you to look at them all and try one. And, and there's actually a lot of different product fits for that based on what your company is. If you're a giant enterprise company, go spend your time and buy some of the best field solvers you can find, okay? If you're a small startup, ask your fabricator because he's the one that's going to have to build it. And if somebody attended the uh, uh, T -T TDR presentation earlier, I mean, you understand some of the value of that. The Essentially, the relative permittivity is basically when my energy is trying to make it through this material, how much resistivity, how much will this material try to stop the propagation of this field wave going through the material? That's what that number is. Okay, a number of one is air. You want to see lightning? That's going through a, a, a decay of one. Okay, so. Um, the low latency, relative low permeativity decreases the latency due to the substrate. Let's see, low dissipation factor, lost tangent. If you're doing RF boards, this is typically one of the first features they're going to be looking at, okay? Um, lost tangent or the dissipation essentially is, you know, energy's never really lost, but let's just say it, it gets misguided now and then. I mean, it's just essentially it drifts out into the material, and a certain amount of that happens. And that's what your RF engineers are typically trying to prevent, okay? And there's a handful of things that go after that and, and, and war against this thing. And the material is only one of them. I put to you that the copper in and of itself, you can lose 0.1 to 0.2 based on how much teeth are sticking down. So I'll show some slides on that one later too. So, um, so any kind of FR4 holding it up or, you know, uh, what we call the epoxy or FR4s, the organic materials, two components to it. It's a resin, it's a weave, okay? And, you know, hold it up. I've got some slides later. You'll see what that weave looks like. The spread weave is when you have differential traces going through. You want one, you want both of them over the same environment. I'll show some slides on that later too. So um, the low profile copper, I talked about that. 
there's a battle, and I'll restate that in there, but essentially it's I don't want loss from the teeth coming down, but at the same time, the warring battle is that I want adhesion from those teeth, okay? So they call, call that peel strength, okay? Probably more of a factor on the outer layers, um, when you kind of rework or anything like that, or usage or something like that, could truly just destroy a board if you lose adhesion. Okay, so I mentioned that high T sub G for multi-layer, high T sub D for high temperature and or multiple lamination cycles. And typically you will find IPC give you slash sheets, which is a general characterization showing many of these. And it's in a spec, anybody know the number? IPC 4101, awesome. Um, and then the slash sheet. And you really wanna pay attention to that. And I encourage you, do not just loosely put a, a material call out on your fabrication drawing seat. Oh, give me IPC 4101 slash 120, or pick a number, 124. So loose. Why would you want to risk your circuit to that kind of loose description? So I'll show you how I'm gonna recommend you approach that, okay? So of course they come in multiple um, different thicknesses and your fabricator has different reasons why he uses different thicknesses, one for performance and also for the manufacturability. So we're gonna actually, Chris is gonna show you, he's gonna load up a couple and we're, gonna, we're getting to the point where um, it's our goal to put all these different um, uh, sheets into Altium so you truly can get your stack up at the beginning of your design and load them into your design exactly as the fabricator tells you. I'm gonna say this is one of the ultimate goals of this class today is to have you guys start addressing the manufacturer of your board, specifically the stack up, day one. I can get a stack up on any board day one. Okay, tell me how, many BG, how big your BGA is, I can tell you how many signal layers. From that I know how many ground returns I need and then I'm gonna pair a power to that ground, probably mixed in with the signal. I've determined the routability on it and what kind of drilling I need based on that pin pitch of that BGA. And I'm calling that fabricator at the end of that day and saying, here's what I'm proposing. I want a 14 layer, I want a 12 layer stack up. This is the drill pitch, this is the trace I want. I want a 50 ohm. I'll let you adjust some of those thicknesses. Give me that stack up today. And I wanna put it in Altium today, day one of it. And I put to you, most of us are not doing that. And you wait till the design is ready and then you're calling up your fabricator and the fabricator's going, oh my God, <laughs> do I have that material? Do we know how to use that material? And or, why didn't you tell me this was common? It's just, it, it's the wrong way we're doing things. We need to change that paradigm and get this into your fabricator and get this part of the engineering part of your design early. Now, if you want to engage your fabricator and have them help you do this research, you ought to have a PO in place early. And I should have asked, is there any purchasing people in the room? Good, good, because I can bag on them all day long, right? <laughs> That's why we're not doing it, because the purchasing people feel like kingmakers, and they're sitting there going, ink a bink a bottle of ink, I'm gonna pick this fabricator who I think. And that is so wrong. It's just an engineering decision, and you should be making it or weighing in on the decision. Your operations people qualify who can build for you. You get yourself three good approved vendors, and you know who's better at what. An RF board and a digital board are two different animals. You know, make sure it's technically appropriate where you build. Right, that, was a, that was a soapbox rant there, though. So thanks. Um, I feel good. So we've talked a little bit about the dielectric, just the properties, electrical and that. The copper. <coughs> For the longest time, again, keep in mind, I did my first PCB in 1976. I don't want to ask you who's wasn't born then, I would like really feel old, but I've been doing this a long time and it was decades that I finally got it. I thought the wires was the whole cat's meow and basically in 1976 the wires probably were the whole energy field, but I've learned now it's, it's a partnership of the metal and the dielectric and actually I should say two pieces of metal and the dielectric between them is that twisted pair and the field lives between them. Back to the copper, 
Copper comes to you, electro deposited copper, a, the, um, the ED is oftentimes referred to, or the rolled annealed. Um, if you ever want to see this, there's giant drums that they're put on. So there's a smooth side against this roll, okay, when it's, when it's taken up, and the rough side. Okay, I usually liked, and I, I didn't bring them, I, I was kind of kicking myself for this, but I like to bring them and pass them out. You feel the different weights. You feel the rough side of that copper. You get some visible learning from it, okay? Um, uh, and then the electroplated copper, essentially when we're trying to Z drill through the holes and add connectivity through the holes, it becomes an electroplated copper, which can add thickness in your metal. And especially when you're doing multi-layer boards, that can add up if you're doing, you know, HDI type vias. We'll cover that later. The other thing, if you visited Tara's presentation, anybody visit Tara's? That's an awesome presentation. I really liked what she showed. But essentially, when you're doing a flex, the, the direction, the grain of the, of the copper plays a big effect, you know, in the whole ductility of how it moves on a flex surface. So that's just another property to the copper. Um, this slide here is showing you, you've heard of skin effect before, right? I don't want to go into in-depth teaching something you've already learned. Um, essentially, where the faster it goes, the more it's truly traveling on the surface of that metal. And therefore, the, if the surface, and here's some magnifications of a very low profile, smoother, versus a standard, you see that it's rough, and that's where it's it's gaining, gaining its adhesion into the resin, okay? And so there's the cartoon image over here showing the thickness in microns. And I, I love hearing different people say why the skin effect is worse on this than others. And, and I will leave that to the material scientists to probably answer that question. Me as a designer, I just need to know if I'm trying to fight loss, it's of high value to me to get low profile copper but I'm fighting a battle with adhesion, okay? And I'm also want to think about whether or not it's a core and the smooth is out here, okay? If I put a ground plane there, I put my skin effect against the ground plane. So when you understand how your board is constructed, you'll add the smooth side where the field goes, okay? So thinking about that and then putting two powers with the rough sides together over a core is smart. Now, we, we hear talk about buried capacitance levels like here, and Rick alluded to this um, in his presentation, and he used two mils. Um, I think two mils is pushing the edge of the envelope of how much you can get by with that. So three is probably the safer number I recommend. Um, there was, uh, who did it, San, San Mean, or one of those guys had that buried capacitance material for the longest time. Um, back in the day, they had a patent on it. All that to say is you can design what I call poor man's buried capacitance. Anytime you can think about this, if I can put my power on my ground plane three mils or four mils apart, if you can do that, now obviously you're now doing it somewhere else in the stack up, right? Because you're building a balanced construction. But if you can do that, you've increased, okay? And if you attended Rick's uh, presentation yesterday, you will basically increase the capacitance, but when it comes to the high speed part of the world, and this shows you that I was paying attention, is that the high end, you're gonna basically, you're going to lower the inductance. You're gonna increase the capacitance, lower the inductance. And in the high speed part of sw switching circuitry, there's where your value added is gonna come, okay? Uh, so there's some um, uh, magnitude uh, of the same image there, okay. This is a slide um, Chris showed me. Matter of fact, I've got a little bit of technical support here. I've got Chris Hunrath, and, and again, Megan is here. Um, they're both my partners in crime and all of this. They, um, they have a booth set up downstairs, and so if you really got some high-end questions, they're probably better <laughs> than me, truly, on the material science. So I'm, I'm gonna point you in that, and they've got some very good information right at their fingertips down there. Um, Chris put this together here, and it just showed you some of the vernacular showing the different types of metal thickness that are kind of out there. And these, some of these are industry acronyms. Some of them are IPC designations. Um, 
I tend to not worry about that too much. It's like, you know, I always make sure that, do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? If I'm talking to this fabricator, you might understand, but then this guy might not. So I don't worry about acronyms as much. I'd prefer to spell it out and make sure the person talking with understands my acronym. So not a fan of acronyms. Um, here we go. Yes, these are the same mag magnification. Um, that's a lot of bling there. Um, this is showing truly what that might look like under a microscope. Um, so you get the point. Okay. So this right here, um, I've somewhat covered this earlier when I've covered this, but what I'm showing is your materials apply to this. I first presented this triangle to you. Steph Chavez from you, um, Rockwell Collins called, dubbed it the, uh, the designer's uh, triangle. Okay, because we need to be looking at our design, everything in our design from these three perspectives. The solvability, the performance, and the manufacturability. And I put to you that materials must also. Okay, thin materials must be used for HDI. For thin traces, you must have a thin material. You probably need a low profile copper if you're gonna attempt a two mil or a three mil dielectric thickness, okay? Um, certain materials are better for drillability. And why do I care about drillability? Because I've got a micro pitch BGA. Who's doing 0.65? Anybody 0.65 pitch BGA? You don't have to sheepishly raise your hand. I, um, yeah, I see, see, I'm seeing a bunch. So meaning you guys are in the HDI world. For the most part, when you hit, I mean, 0.1 is the, the common. 0.8 is memory, right? 0.65 and below, you're probably in an HDI world. Okay, and therefore you're thinking about drilling and thinner materials because that drill width is going to equal the depth of the material. And how big do you want that HDI? I want a four mil. Well, guess how maximum you're going to go? It's about a four mil or less thickness. So that's part of the solvability of this. Um, the other part of the solvability is I don't have room for capacitors. Well, nowadays you can look at some of the, you know, different buried capacitance materials out there. That's part of that solvability. Um, the performance, so you can look at these. So performance, again, is both a, a physical performance and an electrical performance. So this is like what we call it, like a product ladder. It's a way for us who deal in this to kind of <laughs> codify all the different materials that are out there. And it shows you some rationale why you, you would use it. Um, it starts from more of the everyday usage, the 185s. You guys are using 185s, right? Or a 370HR. You guys familiar with that? Yeah? Okay. How many people, when you spec a drawing, you say something or equivalent? You ever use that? And I see heads nodding. And ain't nobody can. Oh, we got a. Approved equivalent. Approved equivalent. That's called plausible deniability. <laughs> um, thank, you. thank you, Carl. Carl is never bashful to raise his hand. I, I love Carl. Uh, so it shows some of the performance metrics in there. But what's interesting is this column right here, and this is available. I, I, I got a bunch here. And if I don't have enough, we can get you more. Um, and these presentations are available. Judy will see to that, or Rachel, or somebody will. Um, is this column right here, it shows some of the performance levels you're doing in here. Um, some of these materials are indeed going to be more expensive, okay? But I put to you when you're prototyping, spare no expense, prove your circuit, and then later if you're going to build in quantity, back that down. Why? Because I want to prove my circuit, okay? I don't want to prove if cheap material destroys my good circuit. I don't have that time and that bandwidth to fail. I want revision one to work. So I'm challenging you to build with good material right up front, okay? And see what frequency of operation you're doing it, and even go higher. Because sometimes the cost delta from going to um, like an I-speed to the, the iTera in here, um, you can get better performance, but sometimes the cost is minimally more but again, I'm playing for the performance of my circuitry. Now the DFX, not every fabricator can build with these materials, okay? There are some who can, some who can't. Most of them probably want to, 
Okay? And if you go and ask them what's a good material to use, does he have any idea what frequency you're operating at? No, no. And if he does, no, he, he just doesn't. Okay? What he's going to tell you is can he build it? Okay? And, so he, and, and typically that means does he have experience with it? He, she, or it. Um, do they have any experience? So if you're trying to use a new material, which I'm encouraging you to do, talk to that fabricator early and say, have you process run this? Have you trial run this material? Um, as I talk with a lot of fabricators and, and they're sending me around, I'm getting to talk to them, they're like, don't push us into the new material. Check with us first. Make sure we've pr process proved that. Okay? So I'm trying to relate that back to you. Call that fabricator, that supply chain, and say, do you have this? You know? Um, and if not, just say, well, I want to use it. Can you start trying to learn? And they'll do some test cases on it. OK. Um, so this is just a comparative slide here showing the performances of both some of the ISOLA materials and some competitive stuff. Um, so again, what are the big factors if I said, ooh, high-speed material? What would you, first thing you'd tell me, you want to DK, right? I kind of seeded that earlier. Well, you can see here that so many of these are already in that low DK. And then if you're doing RF boards, you're going to say, okay, low DF. Okay. So you can see the ones I told you about are, are right down here in the, the best number range. Um, one of the things that I really want to point out here is these materials that I've been telling you about, basically, look at the operational temperature of it. If most of your board, I mean, people use, you know, the you know, other kind of Teflons and stuff like that out on the outer layers because they think they're getting this kind of performance and then they're mixing it with a regular FR4 type of board. It's dissimilar, okay? And they're going to perform under thermal duress differently. And you've got a via that goes all the way through it. A via crack is the most odious thing to the reliability of your board because it's a barrel crack and it's intermittent and it only shows intermittently under thermal cycles. You could test a cold board, works great, fire it up, doesn't work. And the first thing they'll do is they'll blame the assembler. <laughs> Poor guy had nothing to do with it, okay? But the guy in the room who's not in the room is the guilty person. Um, but typically, and it's not really the fabricator, it's you. You made a bad selection up front. So um, that's one factor I'd like you to just be consideration is, is the uh, temperature both in construction and in utilization. The next thing I want to do when I compare the PTFEs to like an Astro material, again, if we're concerned about loss, remember we talked about you know, using this for an RF scenario, is you know, essentially one of the biggest things I want you to see off of this right here is, is look at the, the profile of these magnified cross sections right here. Is the bottom skin effect of this material it's not going to be pretty versus this right here. So you're going to see, although you thought you had better loss, which I showed you from the previous slide, you don't. Okay, this, this difference in loss between here and here, is, or here and here is about the same, but you will have much greater loss between this skin effect and that skin effect. So, question? Pardon? Does the DK change with thickness? So the answer that I typically give for that is essentially that material has a DK rating when they produce it. It comes out of the laboratory, and they send it through their testing. It comes out with what they're going to market as their DK. Okay? But what is this? It's a resin and a weave. And what's the first thing you're going to do when you send it to the fabricator? You're my fabricator. Who is the fabricator? Who is it? We had a fabricator. No? Um, you're going to send it to the fabricator, and what are they going to do? They're going to heat it till that material starts moving. And so <coughs> resin has a dielectric constant, um, was it about two or something like that? Two? Who, who's, going to, who's going to help me out on this one? Megan knows all these answers. Yeah, the DK is going to be around two. I think that's worth saying you need to note, um, especially for like the 370 HR, that for materials, if your different constructions are going to have a different amount of resin, Yes. And so now, 
it gets even probably a little bit more complicated, meaning it's going to move, so therefore the ratio of what that, you know, Rick, Rick explained effective dielectric constant when he talked about being on an outer layer and you had the dielectric constant of air above it, and it, it gave a effective dielectric constant for RF signals on the outer layer, which was incredible to think about. I actually got a light bulb on that one, so thank you. But essentially, it's, it's happening inside also, depending on, well, how many sheets did they use? If I use two sheets, I may have double the weave. And what weight of glass? And the, the weight of glass. And so there's many variables to answer that question. So there's a certain effective dielectric constant that you'll realize. And so theoretical models versus actual models always be different. And Eric will say that's why you test at the back end. So. I got two brownie points out at the same time. <laughs> All right, so this is again another slide showing some, you know, technically appropriate um, materials for frequency of operation. So when you're looking at your circuitry, you know, where where do you intend to, you know, operate? What kind of data transfer? These are more data trans uh, transfer numbers up here, okay? Um, so you can see kind of where they are down in here. So like I said, an, an iSpeed or something like that, or an iTerra, way will outperform. So I, I've talked to a whole bunch of people and said, if you're using iSpeed, consider this iTerra, it's a better performing material for your, for your prototypes, okay? And a mild price point difference. And so the other thing to consider, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, is the spread glass and which materials have that spread glass. And these numbers here typically refer to some of the weave patterns and the material callout. So, so this is a fiber weave effect, it's called, okay? You can see it right here. This is an age old slide. People have been using it for years, but one trace is running over the, the fiber, which is probably five or something like that. And the resin is maybe two, three or something like that. It's pure resin, probably three. So one of them is going to see, and I think, was it Rick? I think you showed the differential pair, or somebody did, where basically one is going to see the hiccup of the difference. And so if it routes consistently over that type of thing, your differential pairs will have skew, okay? Essentially, where the eye diagram will be loose. Um, I could throw a number at you, but it probably depends on a lot of variables, so I'm not going to do that. Um, what you need to think about is if you know you're doing high speed differentials, you should be giving this some thought, okay? Because it will be a performance effector. So that's kind of what it looks like. So you're seeing it there. This was one where they actually etched off some of the resin so you could actually see what the backdrop for these coppers were, okay? You can see here, I wouldn't want to be the copper going over these right here. So it's kind of a, a cool uh, experiment. Um, Chris got me those slides. So all these different families of products have that spread weave. So I'm highly encouraging you to consider that. Um, at San Diego PCB, we had been doing um, the high gigabit data transfer boards and the high frequency, uh, high switching boards for about, I'm trying to think back here, about six, seven years. And th that's how I first met Chris. Chris had come down and had done a lunch and learn um, at, at, at my company and presented this, and we were very scared about this. And we tried one of these materials, and bam, it was, it was truly a game changer for us. Okay, so moving on, um, so some flex is another type of laminate um, that's used for a totally different application. Who does flex in this audience? Awesome, you do rigid flex. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Um, and, and that's typically what we're seeing a whole bunch. The flex, just by definition, it's a way of taking IOs off your board, okay, and sending it through some physically challenged environment to get the connectivity over there. The nice thing is it reduces or removes most of the parasitics from big bulky connectors, okay? Um, so are all signals good to go over flex? Um, some are definitely more challenged to go across a flex environment. So we'll take a little bit of a look at that. Um, but eliminating cables and connectors is going to play into this. And um, so 
you can see that it can be in quite a few applications, feed lines, beam formers, antennas, hybrid boards. Is anybody using any flex polyamide laminates just on a rigid board? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? No. Um, oh, I saw, I saw a couple hands out here. Yeah, we are just to, to eliminate uh, blind and buried bins. Nice. So you know, we've got applications where we've got to put a, a small board up against a metal part. And it, we can't have the vias because the solder mask is eventually not a good insulator. It will short the vias to the metal. Yeah. So instead of doing just standard rigid construction, we do a rigid board but built out of flex materials. So we use the polyimid coverlay as the insulator between the vias. It's, a, it's yeah, used as a coverlay. So there's a handful of things that are really good for that. Um, I'll sh I'm going to cover a couple other ones, but keep in mind when you're using this on a rigid board, there's no weave in here. Okay, that, that base material, there's no weave. So that's one thing. The other thing is it's high temp. It's high temp material. So you know, in the RF world, you have transmitters and receivers. A receiver is all about, shh, be quiet, shh, shh, shh. I want to be sensitive. A transmitter is trying to talk loudly. Therefore, it takes power, and it's hot, okay? So if you've ever designed one of these, you're putting thermal views all along this thing to truly sink away heat, okay? you putting a base layer, and there's a, I'm going to show you some extra, some nice, um, what I'm going to call uh, heat, at, uh, improving uh, polyamide materials to truly dissipate heat and handle a hot signature like that. Um, this is using it again as a, in a beam former type of thing right here. That's a beam for, former. I, I showed you them earlier where you project all those out there. But you can somewhat put that in a, in a tighter foldable application. Okay. Um, and can you handle high speed boards? And I didn't put this one in here. It was done, one we had done uh, for, the, um, for NASA. And um, everyone knows of Hubble. And then there's Kepler. But in 2018, April, they launched the TESS satellite, T-E-S-S, -S, Transitory Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And in there, we put some of this flex materials because essentially there was a processor that went out to the imager and that was the cone for this telescope. It's a digital imaging telescope, okay? And it was five gigahertz signals we put out there, okay? And it was a production run of one. <laughs> <laughs> we built a lot to get there, but the overall cost of it, I'm gonna use the best material I can get my hands on because I got a production order of one. What do I care about? Reliability, okay? Um, so, uh, let's see here. Trying to get through a lot of, um, let's keep going. Um, so this is going to show you a handful of different flex materials. These are some brand names. So essentially, and I've got some, uh, I've got some slides coming up that I'm going to go into more detail. But this shows some of the different. Um, there's typically a base, which is a kapton, okay, and then you're going to have a copper. And if you went to Terra's thing. Oftentimes there's two types. There's an adhesive with a cover lay, or there's adhesive-less okay, material that's on the outer. And several of these, the uh, Pyrolex um, ones, are more adhesive-less. Okay? And so the AP is a standard. Um, it's truly the most reliable flex material in the market. Um, Y'all heard of the Rover out on Mars? Right now, that little beaming thing, man, it's got some AP sitting out there. You know, it was supposed to die years ago, and that thing just takes a licking and keeps on ticking out there. Um, but it's got AP on it. So uh, the HT is a, is a high temp version of it, and the TK is a high speed version of it. So again, some parameters here, both in physical and, and some electrical, um, electrical and physical right there to look at. And again, you get all this on your slides. And I have some of these here also for these. These are mostly made by DuPont. I mean, there's other manufacturers. They're just not up here presenting, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this shows some of the different types. I mean, IPC loves to put everything in a type, okay? 
I never remember what those types mean, so I just put them on the slides. Um, but there's all types, and we have many, so many different applications, so hopefully you can see something you're building up there. Um, you know, rigid flex rigid down here. Typically when you're going to that many multi-layers, um, and I know Tara brought this out, you put them in basically a loose leaf, okay, you get some foldability out of there, and they put them, um, you know, with some air gap between them. And the more critical part is to typically uh, right at the adhesion points right here. So, um, okay, let's keep going. Uh, this gets into some of the construction on it, and I'm not going <laughs> to, matter of fact, the joke with Chris is always I, I like to impress him. I like to impress him with how much I don't know about flex construction. And I'm just being honest. Um, I'm, I represent a lot of designers in this, okay? Um, so I'm going to make a teaching point out of what I don't know. And that is, as a designer, I know how to do a circuit. Remember the solvability? I can get it. I can get those traces over there. I can follow some of the flex instructions of bend points, tear points, and all that kind of stuff. And I can understand the performance, okay? And we're going to cover a couple of those in a second. Um, but the manufacturability of it, don't know. Why? Because I've not toured that many fabrication flex shops, okay? And I've not attended enough of Terra's type of, you know, flex construction. So um, I hope to grow in my own knowledge of this. But the downside of that is, is I leave the fabrication instructions till the very last second of my fab drawing, go to Gerber. Is anybody else doing that? I mean, be honest, right, right? I see one honest hand. Get the guy a coupon, man. I love that. I see, all right, all right, all right. See, come on. Remember, lightning bolts strike if you don't answer. I'm kidding. Um, learning how they're constructed. Again, there's adhesive. You can see adhesive right in here. So it's a capton, then an adhesive, and then the copper, and then typically a cover leg. Okay? So then, unless you have some that are adhesive less, uh, where we go? So know that and if you want to talk to more um, so the adhesive less most of these are the pyrolex ones are the adhesive less but uh, if you want to know more visit our booth downstairs okay there's the draw my lack of knowledge sends you to the booth all right this again i brought it up here because it's it's we call it a product ladder but it's a it's a piece of paper that i hope you because most of us design a flex what one every 15 boards every 20 boards is that a good number pick a number that, that's not like a good number, right, Carl? I mean, I don't do it that often. So therefore, I forget between boards what parameters I need to do. So having an aid like this at your side and on your desktop of reference materials going, hey, we got a flex board coming up next week. Boom, you pull something like that out. Think of that material from day one. Okay, that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Um, it shows the different ones here, the AP, and there's another one, AG. I don't know if I see it on this list here, but it's basically more of a low, lower cost to the AP. The HT, I told you, was the um, high temp, and there's a couple of them in there. Um, the TK for the high frequency. So um, pursue this. Make this a resource to your desktop. Okay, so switching again to a different part of this. So we've talked about, you know, regular rigid laminates. We've talked about copper. We've talked about some polyimid flex materials. Now I'm going to talk about another thing that is really part of the material. Most of us have been doing vias and how are we getting Z-axis connectivity. We're drilling a hole and then we're plating it, okay? This is one of the most dangerous things that happens on a printed circuit board. It's the weakest link, and that's a plated via. And with the pitches of ICs getting tighter and tighter, I need a smaller and smaller drill. And at the same time, I'm adding more layers. That creates what kind of a problem? You learned this if you took your CID. It's called an aspect ratio. You guys are good. That's essentially the overall thickness of the board divided by that hole, okay? And 10 to 1 is like about the extreme you should be at, okay? And you may call your fabricator and ask him if he can put a 5 mil drill in a quarter inch board. <laughs> He'll laugh, but here's why he's laughing. 
because it's, it's a circuit board shop in Virginia, and I'm not going to name their names, and they will charge you 20 grand to build that board. Wow. <laughs> That's why he's laughing. I mean, because everyone else is laughing. No, they're actually, they're afraid. They can't build it. So we're going to show you some options, which is really up and coming, and everyone is probably sitting here with one of these bad boys in your pocket, okay? Um, and they have this type of via built into them because most of the boards are very thin. So if I make a thin board, thin dielectrics, I'm going to have a thin trace and a small via. Okay, and you can only, if you're doing HDI, who's doing HDI in here? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Two layers, three layers, four. Anybody doing four? Yeah. And f five, it's hard to do much more than that if you're doing regular, what they call sequential lamination. Well, you have the n number of layers. Let's put 10 in here, okay? And then you're going to add two, add another one, add another one. And you can do that about four times, adding a micro via down one layer from the top and the bottom four times. But you're going to laminate it in a heat press, okay? And your material, the T sub D, we talked about that earlier, will turn to dust. You go more than four to five times, most material cannot withstand that many thermal excursions. Plus, after that, you're going to go assemble it and add it to, through two thermal excursions in assembly, and then usage. But you'll actually probably destroy it in just the initial fabrication. It, you know, so the right T sub D is important if you're doing that. But the cell phone guys come along and say, guys, no, 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 no. We have to solve this. One of the things that they've come up to solve, and it's actually from a, a company that was originated here, and I don't know, is, uh, is Jim in here, the audience, anywhere? Jim, Jim, Bueller, no. Um, he's not, but um, Ormet. Anybody heard of Ormet before? Okay, nice, okay. More than the, come on. Some of you guys have used Ormet before, I know you have. Um, Ormet is an ability to do um, adding a sintered paste between two layers and just add a whole bunch of them together, one lamination. And it can be a mighty small via, okay? Um, I think the smallest one we did was truly a mil, two mil type via, okay? And it was basically a package design, so it's used on package design. Who does package design in here, anybody? Anybody, okay. So, so you, I don't know how many layers you're doing on your package design. Are they high? Oh, well, some of the package designs are very high layer counts. You have to use this. I mean, basically the BGA chip sits on a package and then the BGA balls are underneath it, but they've got to get that silicon dye through the package out to the BGA balls. And typically they're using this type of a via structure to do it, okay? Um, so it's going to reduce the amount of lamination cycles. It solves the aspect ratio and um, annular ring concerns for class three type builds. Okay. Um, you, you actually just can't go smaller than, gosh, like an eight, eight mil drill nowadays um, and build a class three board. It's just, it's very difficult to do that. So, um, so you get a significant increase in routability and uh, essentially you can get rid of all plated through holes and do a full blind build where you're just stacking them all. And if you only want a, a transmission line that's gonna go so far on the top layer, come down and go here, this is a parasitic stub to the performance of this signal. Okay, so one option is you could back drill it. Good luck with that. It's expensive, it's reliability. I mean, good fabricators can do it with relative ease. But um, I put to you, in this case, I'd be able to, if I use this type of via, I can put anything I want to down here. I can put other vias, I can put traces. So the solvability, designed for solvability using Ormet type vias, off the charts good, okay? Um, I, I'll show you a few other advantages here. So essentially, um, uh, matter of fact, Nikki, you didn't raise your hand. I know you've used some Ormet vias before. Um, it's like a 16 or 18 layer board. Um, and it was the only way you could basically get the type of drilling they wanted to do, okay? Um, check this one out here. This is a kind of a cool example right here. So if I was to drill this board and try to truly get through it, the overall, um, 
Basically, it is four 0.092 thick cores, and I can use an eight mil drill. The total board thickness is this. If I wanted to try to drill it, I'd have a 48 to one aspect ratio. You ain't gonna build that, unless you're that company on the East Coast that wants to charge you 50,000 or 100,000, that you can't do it. But if you break it into four different sublaminations and then put an Ormet paste between them right here, here, and here, now I have four 11 to one aspect ratios. Is that fine to build? Absolutely it is. So that's essentially, and that's a nice micro section of what it would look like there. Okay. Um, this shows just again some construction of how that's done. Um, overall board thickness, and again, when uh, this is one of the, oops, let's go back. It shows another one of those crazy thick ones over here. Um, you, just, you can't drill that and plate it. That's the problem is you can't plate a very thick aspect ratio or high aspect ratio. Okay. <coughs> Again, shows some of the constructions used there, how it's used. Um, I like this one right here. So it shows that if you put four cores, essentially, then you would um, put some prepreg between and drill it and put the ormet in there in one lamination cycle. Yeah, Russ. Is there any uh, tendency to have metal separation, like instead of having a BS crack, a barrel crack, I don't have any copper plating now. What about, how, how robust is that? Well, I'm going to give you the sales answer and say it's robust, meaning I personally have not seen enough studies to answer that question accurately. Chris is probably my go to guy right now. So, can can you speak to the reliability, which was somewhat at the heart of this? Is there any? Has there been studies done to that? I'm, I. And there, there is a thing um, up on the web called the Ormet University. So if you want to learn a little bit about that Ormet U, I mean, I think that's still up there. Um, and or again, see, see Chris afterwards. I, I'd encourage you to pursue that kind of knowledge on it. Um, but from a solvability, you can see this is really going to help you. Um, we're actually trying to design a, a test vehicle where we can put whatever stack up you want and give you some you know, Pico probes on both ends and, and test it. And so you can see some actual performance of how whatever material you choose over whatever stack up using a material like this would perform. So if you're interested in that, see me afterwards. Um, What's the cost well, what's the cost delta between the two? It's, a, it's gonna be more, but it, it, it's, it's not a fair comparison, meaning that I can't solve the other board using that, so it, it's a different ball game. You very easily could, yes. Right. Right. I know on Nicole's board, she actually has some regular drilled vias, and they put into three books, okay, with regular drilled vias, both blind and buried and through for the book, and they joined the three books together with Ormet here and here. So it's not an either-or. Yeah, it can, it, well, it can be either-or, or it could be all of one or the other. It's not, a, it doesn't have to be exclusive. No, it can be a combination. So um, yes, it's a cost adder, but again, it, at that point, 
the overall cost is negligible. It's a technology adder. Yeah. I like that I said technology adder. That's actually one, I want to trademark that word there. So. <laughs> Sounds like sales speak almost. OK. Um, HDI definition, again, most of you, um, this is coming. Um, where I forget where I got this uh, definition from. Essentially, here's what I would like you to draw off of this one right here is HDI is not just laser vias, okay? HDI is many things when you think about it, starting with, in my opinion, um, micro traces is a form of HDI. Um, via in pad is a form of HDI. Micro vias, blind vias, buried vias. Um, other microvia techniques like we just talked about there, buildup lamination, these are all parameters that make high density interconnect. Okay, so somewhat shifting gears into, into HDI and trying to keep an eye on my time clock here. I'm in the 20 minutes, so we're doing pretty good. Um, this is the definition out of the IPC 221. This is the important thing you get out of this one right here is the one to one ratio, aspect ratio between the width versus the height. And, um, or less, it could be less than that, um, the 0.8 to 1. Most ma manufacturers are trying to exceed this 1 to 1, but it can't be anything greater than that, so they go less than that, the 0.8. Okay, um, so to most CAD software, uh, uh, an HDI laser via, it's just a regular via, but you're specifying the layers of, uh, to traverse, okay? Um, the landing pad versus the target pad. Um, typically, I make them the same size, but in all actuality, you see them, they're usually V-shaped like this because the bottom one could be a little bit smaller. I let my fabricator pull that back if he'd like to. He likes spaces at times. Other times, he wants more metal, okay? I'm going to kind of stay out of his business and do mine. I give a one-to-one -one between the top pad and the bottom pad, but know that they will probably pull that bottom one in based on it's a slightly conical type of V shape. Okay. Um, so the concept of planning your routing requirements. Um, oh, before I do this, I love showing this one here. This is somewhat in, 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 in uh, uh, to give some, uh, Honor and deflection to Happy Holden, who has talked a lot about landless vias. And most time fabricators are going, oh. And most designers go, yeah, right. And I'm going to tell you straight off the bat, don't you dare go back to your company and say, I'm going to go do this. OK? <laughs> don't you dare. And don't you dare say, Mike said you could do it. It has been proven back when most OEMs had their own fabrication, OK? Um, HP and stuff like that, and Foxconn, and, when we're happy worked at these places, they did their own manufacturing. They came up with a proprietary method to do a landless type vias. And why it, it works, as I did my research, and you can see what it kind of looks like, is the smaller you make the annular ring, it just gets more bad, bad, bad. It gets worse and worse up until the, the annular ring actually disappears. And the reason that is is because plated copper is more ductile. Okay, that's how that construct kind of works. So when you truly have an annular ring, as in right here, it's more subject to failure because that is not as ductile. It's, a, it's truly, you know, probably a rolled annealed type copper. Um, but when it truly, on this example right here, just is electroplated, that is more ductile. It's more moldable, movable. So at some point, we will need this. We will get to this. We will get back to it if... Happy was in the room, he'd say that. But um, keep your minds open to this. There's a handful of fabricators that are trying it. The IPC Technical Advisory Committee uh, formed a committee to look at this, and they're trying to look for fabricators that will volunteer and try to experiment with this. We need to get to it because there are pin pitch BGAs that are getting down so small. We have to have this. So, and or using an Ormed via. So keep that in your head. All right, this is a simple slide. I'll cruise through it pretty quickly. It shows you some of the different IPC types for HDI and or drilling. Um, so the via in pad, essentially do, instead of doing a dog bone, you put the via right in the pad, but then you plate it shut, okay? Um, 
and then here is essentially where you're just, you can laser down one, or in this case, you laser down one or laser down two. Um, they set the wavelength on the laser drills to stop when they see metal, and then they change it when it'll go through metal. Okay, so that's kind of how they can go multiple layers. Um, I don't like these because they have to be pretty big to go down to two with the aspect ratio thing. What would the, this depth be? Typically eight mils. It's a mechanical drill at eight mils, so I'm not a fan of that, this one right here. Okay, this is the standard HDI you start seeing, this type two, and as they go on, um, where you have a, a base layer, and then you're gonna add two. Okay, so you're gonna plate that via, laminate it, and then you're gonna add two other la layers onto it, drill and plate, and you're gonna do it again. The thing I want you to remember is every time you plate, you're adding a metal thickness. And if I have a, Carl said he did a 4N4 or a 5N5, okay, do you know how much plating goes on to plate a hole? Anybody? And you can have it on two sides. How much metal thickness is added to your board when you plate a drill hole? Well, it, it takes, to, uh, the IPC specification, it, the correct answer is what class is the board? Because a class two is about 0.7 mil, a class three is about 0.8 or something like that. But think a mil, at least, okay? To get a mil in the, in the plating of a hole in its conical shape, you gotta put about 1.4 mils of plating on the outside to get that. So if I'm doing it on two sides, so there's three mils, six mils, nine mils, 12 mils. Carl's board, if he went four and four, grew by almost 10 to 12 mils in thickness. And if we don't think about that through, guess what, the board is bigger than what you might have expected. All right, so there's showing how those go on. Uh, I think we already covered that. Um, so this image was cited from the Samsung Electronics uh, Mechanics. It was an article, I think, in UP Magazine. And it's showing on essentially what is the phenomena where we're in the evolution of going from a standard subtractive type process, which gives us a line profile like this, that when I etch down, I'm etching in, and I have etch loss. Your fabricators get that. They oversize your line, knowing what their etch loss will be. But nevertheless, this is the image, and is geometrically called a trapezoid, okay? And when you start thinking of high-speed skin effect, most of that skin effect is down here. And some starts going up the side. I don't like a trapezoid. The faster I go, I don't like trapezoid. Now that's the performance of my triangle. What about the manufacturability of it? Can I do that on a one mil line? If I'm etching down actually almost two mils, I started out with one mil of base copper, I plated it one mil. If I etch down two mils, I'm etching in two mils. A four mil line can almost disappear if you don't oversize it. You want a three mil line? Don't put them on the outer layers, guys. You can't build it. So as we start thinking about micro BGAs in HDI, you need a smaller line. Therefore, this type of process is coming on the modified semi-additive process. This is more in packaging, you know, the BGA type packaging. And um, this essentially and I can give you a rough description of it. Essentially, they, they put a full base metal down, they strip it away, leaving some of the teeth, and then they add on from there. That's, that's the best way I'm gonna describe it for you. Uh, if you want better than that, go see someone who actually does it. Um, the end result, which is what I do wanna make sure you're aware of, is it looks like this. And would you rather have truly a sidewall that looks like that or like that? It's a no-brainer. You want truly a sidewall that looks like this. And plus, that's a one mil line. <laughs> it's a two mil line. I can route a micro BGA using that. But you're gonna need, normally it's a one to one ratio, my line width to my dielectric thickness. A little more than that, but just for rough thinking that if I have a two mil line, you may have a two mil dielectric ballpark, okay? Uh, this shows, again, some of the density doing these type of designs here. Um, how many layers? Via, so I'm going to skip over that. Routing density. Um, so 
Um, whoops, let me go back to this one right here. So if you're going to, I encourage you to go see Susie Webb's routing presentation. She's going to talk a whole bunch about different routing techniques, routing skills, and also what you're going to see in the Altium software is pretty cool. Some of the advancing they have after that's over. So I encourage you to attend that. But again, HDI helps with via starvation. You can double the layer or the amount of vias by using that, okay? Um, this was, I think, a happy slide right here. And you truly, instead of getting what would be two, four, six, eight, ten, I think I'm getting 18 or 16 or 18 lines here by, on a very dense BGA, low layer count, by using HDI, I can improve my routing density. This is part of that solvability. Happy Holden is, um, and I got it written down here. Um, he's oftentimes, he's spoken here a lot, so if you haven't heard him, um, he has a HDI handbook, which I'd encourage you to get. But again, Happy Holden was truly, they call him the father of HDI because he pioneered this stuff uh, quite a long time ago and has been supporting and educating within our industry. Um, so he's published and uh, widely uh, spoken also on a lot of the trade uh, magazines and journals. Pardon me? I think they're both his, right? Oh, the bottom one's yours? Oh, Susie. Can I buy dinner? <laughs> I knew I got it from somewhere. I get to do a version of Susie's in Germany, so um, thank you for your support. Keep those cards and letters coming. Um, are any of these yours? <laughs> so it's now 15 bucks I owe you. Um, OK, let's keep going. This one's mine. <laughs> you notice the high quality? <laughs> this is meant to be rough for a reason. What I want you to this is very important image right here. When you're trying to solve HDI, you need to think, how do I pin escape? You need to look at it from a side profile. And that's what that slide's attempting to do. And you're theorizing, how far do I go into the BGA to pin escape? Because you'll notice from here, BGA is essentially, when you're routing a BGA, it's what I call a wagon wheel. You break it into four quadrants. This quadrant, you route up and right. This quadrant, you route right and down. And down and left, left and up. OK, it's a wagon wheel. You have to find out. Otherwise, if you're routing over it, you use the routing channels for the left quadrant. You can't do that. Okay, that being said, I need to solve for one quadrant of a BGA. Typically, powers are, core powers are in the center of a BGA, you'll see right here. And a well-constructed BGA, which Rich was telling us about yesterday, has a good distribution um, of grounds and, and voltages, typically should be like that, throughout the board, e equally dis, um, dispensed around, okay? Um, not all of them have that, but essentially you're looking at one quadrant because what's typically in one quadrant will be used on all quadrants unless they're not using a bank of an IC, but that's an exception. The point being is think through in a feasibility how I will pin escape this, okay? And I can do that on day one of a layout. Now I can go get a stack up and pick, pick my materials for that. So that's important. Um, this covers the stacked or staggered, and no, this is not a pool room or a bar room analogy. <clears throat> this is showing you the question of can I stack my vias on top of one another, or do I need to spiral them or stagger them type of thing? Know that when they do stagger them, and we'll, we'll just try to answer that question in a second, when they do stagger them, essentially they don't have to fill them. They don't have to, okay? Um, there's always a plating. You can see the layer of plating. Okay, so initial copper and then the plating. But um, if they do stack them, they typically will fill them. Okay. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about via filling in a second. Um, but just know that that's typically how that plays out. And so there's actually um, an extra layer of metal in there to coplanar cap them. Okay, so I'm telling you, you can stack microvias, but don't stack them like this on top of the through via in the middle. And I don't really like this slide for that reason, but I leave it up for this reason is over here. Know that when you have this, oftentimes you will get what's known as glass crush, 
where the material, the resin will squeak out and all that's left in there is the, is the fiber of the glass. And actually electro, the calf effect can really spread in that scenario because it, it conducts down the fibers, okay? This one here shows you what I'm recommending. You can stack these, this is a 4N4 construction. You can stack these because there's such a thin dielectric. And the reason you don't want to stack them here is because one, if you didn't put a cap layer, that'll happen. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, it happened on another CAD tool and they didn't have a check for that. So, um, so we won't talk about rules right now. <clears throat> This one describes one of the reasons you don't want to do it real good is essentially if this is um, a non-conductive fill and you typically want to do non-conductive fill in the through via and the reason is is essentially metal heat's different than the resin and essentially it can cause stress and fracture failure on your via wall. The most vulnerable part of your board is the via. Okay, so you don't want that. Um, so therefore you non-conductive fill that if you stack them, you'd have to plate them, otherwise you'd get this, stupidity, okay? But if you plate it and stack it anyway, this via cone, this is a half section, cross section, will act as a thermal barrier and the resin inside will not heat up as much as this stuff externally and it actually collapses along with this one expanding. And so therefore this drops and you'll get this opening or that type of failure. That's why I'm going to recommend. Y'all do what you want to do. I'm recommending what I've, I did that board. <laughs> so, um, but I only did it once. I only did it once. I learned my lesson. So um, you say, well, gee, that looks a little bit goofy there. Hey, that's a robust connection. Yes, it looks a little bit skewed, but it's still a very robust. It happened all the way on that layer right there. And that's why they do cross sections. They say, all right, who was the guy that did that third layer down? <laughs> You know, they can process, uh, anal analyze that. <clears throat> Here would be a sintered via profile right there, maybe, or a full stack, okay? But all these things are things you're considering. Testability, reliability, you know, is it lighter, performance, less parasitics? Um, all these things are part of that triangle perspective. But you want to research all of these and think them through at the be beginning of the layout. Um, and nobody does fly in 3D board better than all team. Did I get an amen on that one? Yeah, all right, yeah, I mean, it, it, you gotta admit that, oh, there it is again. That's techno sexy, man, I love that. That is just really cool. And yes, it just looks cool, but no, I get to go in there and I get to visually see what that structure looks like, okay? How I've defined it, okay? Um, essentially, I'm getting this type of visibility prior to building it. So I encourage you when you define it, take the fly-in view and do that. And just take a look at it. If you see <coughs> improper metal thickness, that'll show. You see improper dielectric thickness, all those things will show. It's a visual check that's worth doing. Uh, there's yeah, another example. Um, does it take longer to, <laughs> to do an HDI board? Absolutely, it's a 3D route, okay? And you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna always say, when are you done with the layout? Um, my answer to that is, I'm done five days after you're done engineering that schematic, okay? Um, so, and, and then they're going to immediately look at the guy doing the schematic. Oh, wait, that's you. Um, and you're going to say, guess what? I may be changing this schematic now in Rev 1, but you ain't going to build Rev 2. Now, you put yourself on the line by saying that, but that's your excuse why you're taking more iterations to make that Rev 1 work. So, um, Okay, so back to the performance part of it. Again, most of this, you got this if you attended Rick's um, class, but essentially when we're thinking about this, um, the performance of the signal is best indicated by you learning about its rise and fall time, um, which is shown right here. And essentially, it, the frequency, essentially think of this like an accordion. When this thing collapses, okay, that rise time is gonna go like this. So when your frequency is increasing, you're, you're closing these in, and that rise time will increase. And you know what else is going to happen? The voltage is typically going to come down. Okay, that's typically how these things work. So you're seeing the faster rise times with lower voltages. Okay, <clears throat> but 
This essentially gives you a distance by which your signal, it takes to propagate to its end of the line, okay? And you've heard a lot about that, but this is probably the most important thing you're gonna get. And anything you do that's not intelligent signal integrity routing, and what do I mean by that? Hug your ground plane. If you do not have an uninterrupted ground plane for your signal, if you do not have an uninterrupted zero volts ground plane for your power plane, you designed a bad board. Stop, don't go any further. Just stop, go back and figure it out. You must have an uninterrupted return path for every signal, an uninterrupted return path for every voltage power rail on your board. Okay, and to me, I'm just a big fan of ground planes, every other plane. It's just that simple. Put a signal down, backfill it with power. Now I'll have equal copper distribution for, for, etch, for um, when they plate it, okay? They'll have, uh, won't have etch loss affecting one side more or less than the other. So, okay, um, keep going. Uh, similar slide to what you saw in Rick's um, per, uh, uh, Rick's presentation here. Essentially the concept of, of a signal going down and back is how most people conceptualize return path. We're at about the five, okay, thanks. Um, when actually the field effect is immediate, okay? EM, electromechanical, uh, or, or magnetic, excuse me. Um, electrical capacitive, magnetic inductive, EM, okay? So if you deal with the EM of every signal, you're not generating noise. You cross a split plane, like in this one right here, you're generating noise. So why do you want split planes? They generate noise, okay? But essentially when you've satisfied every signal, you're not making noise. And the whole thing of doing shielding to the overall board is making a Faraday cage, okay, to contain it from the goes into and the goes outa. Okay, you don't want any of your signals going out. You don't want anyone else's signals coming in. That's the shielding you need to do for good EMI um, design. But from a signal integrity standpoint, if you satisfy, I call this thing a spider. It looks like it's a spider crawling along. And um, what you'd learn from attending Rick's here is these are two single-ended, probably a little bit smaller than this guy, so probably 45 ohm characteristic impedance signals, but they're coupled at about 10% together. Collectively, it's a 100 ohm differential signal. Okay, they do that essentially, they can lower voltage when they do that. So that's one of the reasons LVDS, lower voltage uh, digital signals. Um, so that's the quick version. Um, but again, I put this out here because I want people to conceptualize what you're seeing. This is, you live in San Diego, I can zap that kitty cat. You put the fear of God in that kitty cat. Um, that's what that looks like there. Uh, if you live in the Midwest, you've seen lightning, okay. Um, you don't want to be the guy that has the house underneath the power lines, right, um, type of thing. But just remember, energy field exists between the trace and the return path. It's in the dielectric materials. I mean, that in a nutshell is why I took this position at Inselectro. That sentence, that's why, okay? So I'd be up here communicating that. Um, okay, so dense boards, this whole thing, I, I always hate this thing, well, RS black magic, I hate that. That's line, okay? That means that there's some secret sauce that you don't get to know, therefore you don't get to do any thinking. That's why I hate it. Here's how to avoid that. This applies to any board you do. If you're making a stack up, okay, and Rick did a very elaborate, all these different stack up solutions, so check his paperwork on that. Whatever you do, and I'm not even saying this is the greatest one, do this is you sketch a resistor symbol from your signal to an adjacent uninterrupted zero voltage ground return. <coughs> your signals will perform great, okay? And you sketch a capacitor between any kind of power plane and then you have a tightly coupled, high capacity, low inductive plane. When you theorize any stack up you're thinking of, you figure out how many layers do I need to pin escape this, I know how many signals I need. My BGA tells me I need, I need eight. Okay, well I can get two between pins, so I need four. You see, I mean, I knew that right from just that quick of looking at it, and then everybody gets a ground plane. If I can't draw it with that, so no, mostly what you'll see is I'll do delivery right here, 
and then I'll put my usage higher up in the stack up. Okay? So that's what those cover. Don't do this. <laughs> um, you may think that a dual asymmetrical strip line is good. It's not. Okay? You can theorize it all day long, but in reality, because your BGA is that dense, you'll route it like this, and you've made a crosstalk nightmare. You truly have. Okay? So you can read all the rationales for that. Just don't do it. Don't do an asymmetrical strip line. Figure out a way to do a single strip line. Okay, um, this is about power delivery. Usually I like to bring it out in the core and the center, and then I like to take it up to the top, and I'll do poor man's thin dielectrics up here, about three, okay? And it's close to the usage, therefore the cap up here, it's a low inductance for the cap. <coughs> Rick gave the, the PhD version of this. I'm just gonna implement what he taught me, and that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm doing it on both sides of the board. It's just that simple. And I'm gonna make isolated islands on these top few layers for these parts and on the bottom few layers of usage for the bottom parts. And that's what a cross section would look like. You actually see the weave there and you see the buried conductive uh, uh, capacitor. This is actually a BC type of material called Intera. It's truly one of the best. I've used a handful of them. I like this because what's in the center of the material um, you can get more of a material science answer of what's in the center of it, but it's got a better material in the center. So um, I'm encouraging you to use that. You, if you don't have, if you have spacing requirements, um, that'll help. If you have performance requirements, that'll help. <coughs> RF type routing, um, essentially you're making a coplanar waveguide. Typically you're adding a via fence around it. I'm a big fan of via fences. Guy says, I want a split plane. I said, no, you don't get a split plane. I'll get, you want isolation? I'll give you a via wall. I'll give you a via fence. And the guy goes, but I want, really want a lot. I said, fine, I'll offset it and I'll go two. He said, no, I really want a lot. I'll give you three rows and I'll keep offsetting each row. And essentially when you put a via at 1 20th of what is the signal's wavelength, you've blocked any emissions. Why do you think a backup a projector has a graded thing on there? Why do you think your microwave has a mesh? Okay, it's truly a 1 20th of the wavelength scenario to block emissions. That's what a via fence will do. Okay, back to here, I told you I'd return to it. When you're designing a board, in any aspect, you have to think that through, and boom. I only went seven minutes over, and thanks, Rachel, for the call. Yeah, you did good. Yeah, good luck with that. My wife's been trying that for a long time. Thank you. So now at this time, we have a little bit of time, so I encourage you to hang around. I'm inviting Chris Carlson, our resident FAE, to come up. And I'm going to get out of this. And he should have his already preloaded. I'm just going to set that down, and then you're good to go. Um, so what we're going to do with this is it's a little bit interactive. Um, Chris may have some stuff he wants to show. My next question to you guys is, based on what you've seen, I talk fast, you listen fast, there's a few questions. Are there any other questions you've got <coughs> right at the tip of your tongue right now? Could you talk more about spread and exactly what that term means? It's where they take the glass weave that's in, in your material and they spread it out so that there'd be no air gaps. Otherwise, there's air gaps in a weave. Think of a weave pattern, kind of like a lawn chair, the old school lawn chair. Okay, it's a weave pattern and there's a gap. And if two differential traces, one traveled over the weave and the other one traveled over the resin, they'd have dissimilar dielectric constants. So they spread the weave out so that there's no checker pattern distinguishable. Spread. Spread glass and, and you can get, I can get, I have a picture of it here and you can get one downstairs. Definitely pick one up because it's if you do an high speed board, you want to know about this. Yeah, so I've used the uh, 3313 thread. Yeah, yeah, I saw you had 1086. 1086 is like a was a 1086 is like 1080, but the six was the, is the spread glass version of a 1080, just like the 1067 is the spread glass version of the 106. But it's the same property material, but they spread the weave out. Uh, availability, you've got to talk to a salesman to that. I have no clue on what's available. 
Um, so probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually was going to point out that I think that's our core language are as spread last version. And uh, my, my real question, uh, you said you didn't enjoy offset spread lines. Uh, how do you feel about broadside? I hate them. I d highly dislike broadside coupled signals. Um, First of all, if you actually do the calculation on it, you've got to add a serious amount of dielectric to make it 100 ohm. Who here has got tons of extra space to put on a multi-layer board? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> it, it, so that alone shoots that apart. Where I see it used is on giant backplanes. Giant ba backplanes where they're going, there's a good application. Because would they couple better like this? You betcha. OK. But if. Anywhere else on that layer over here, someone coupled two signals, the crosstalk would destroy that signal because you helped this guy out. So when I do something on a layer, I want it to be good for any, any resident on the layer. Yeah? What about differential signals weave on the flex circuit? So on a flex circuit, first of all, there's no weave. Oh, so on a flex circuit, and I answered this question in Tara's thing, first of all, you want, from a signal integrity standpoint, there's two things, a mechanical, I don't want a big piece of copper, I can't bend it, okay? So the solution, everyone says, well, go with a hatch pattern. Well, I don't want an orthogonal hatch pattern or I got the same problem. They say, shoot it 45 degrees on the flex. MarCAD tool can do that. But now the return path is going like this. I don't like that. I'll go with the hatch pattern because I want an EM shield, but what I'll do is behind the signal trace on that ground layer, I'll add a piece of copper right through the hatch pattern, which gives me a perfect EMI return path for that signal traversing the flex. So wherever that trace goes, I've added, so if my signal's this wide, this guy's about three. Okay, so it gives me a little bit of, remember the spider, the, the field coming down. That makes sense? And so you get the flexibility, you'll get a shield and a good return path. Why don't you keep doing Q's and A's? Because um, we're chewing I'm not it. Not going to get through this, but I'll make myself available out here at the Altium booths to go through right. some of this stuff if people are interested. Okay. Cool. So yeah, and a couple of things that Chris right. had in here, I'm just going to speak to, but because um, again, I want Altium you guys to see features. Is we're really looking at trying to get materials truly into the Altium product. Okay. You can add them in there. As a matter of fact, you have that I think on the screen. Yeah. We've added a. Uh, the materials library, and um, there's some kind of basic generic materials in here, but you can add to this. Um, I added a uh, few Isola products in here uh, just from data sheets that Mike provided me, but when you click I new, you're basically just um, filling out the data sheet information. The um, construction, that's basically the weave call out. And the rest of this, you know, just line items in a data sheet. Um, we also which version? Uh, we added this, I believe, in um, Altium Designer 18. Yeah. 19. Okay. What, one of the things that's not fully in, in, in implemented right now is the ability to mm -hmm. add multiple sheets of prepreg. I don't, is that in there yet? Oh, yeah, you can do that. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, you can do that. It's asymmetric. Uh, okay. Is Oops. What's that? Is there a way to do a bulk import? Like, do we have a nice spreadsheet? Yeah. Um, instead of having to do it one at a time? Answer is yes, no, maybe. Um, <laughs> basically, this data is stored in an XML um, file. It's, you can actually get to it, open it up, look at it. You could probably um, write a script to generate that XML, say, from a spreadsheet. So if, if I'm going to cut in here, too, because I said this a lot, the last time I was up here, what I'm pushing for in the industry, and so I have a responsibility to t carry it to you, pass the baton to you, is in the same way you have an intelligent data output, be it ODB++ or 2581, right? It's an intelligent output. Any CAD tool can produce that. And a fabricator says, got it, go. I want to see us get to the point where we're in a universal intelligent data input, whereby 
you're saying, I think I want to use this type of board, a 12 layer with tachyon or astra or whatever, whatever drill, you approach your fabricator at the beginning, he gives you an output from his Genesis or, or whatever tool he's using, he shear it, and gives that to you. It imports into any CAD tool, especially Altium, um, and it loads exactly the profile that the manufacturer wants. And what it does is, because see, they have design rules and they may be different than the design rules you have in there. And they're manufacturing rules that they can build to. Whereas you have design rules that you can solve to. So there's a difference, so. Yeah, and right now, um, we're working out the details of how to manage it, but um, ultimately, the um, materials, fabricators, materials suppliers will be adding that information into our database. Um, the question is just how to manage that, and they've got several ideas, but that's, that will be coming. A um, couple other things that we've added. Um, we actually have a solver. We use a Siberian um, solver for doing your impedance um, calculations for um, both differential pair as well as single-ended impedance. And you can have as many of these impedance profiles as you wish. And let's add one. Let's add a differential. And when you're looking at this, little graphic over here shows you um, what it's calculating and how it's calculating it. Uh, the etch factor, 2.5 is generally an acceptable number for that. That's basically width 1 minus width 2 um, divided by 2, taking into account the cross-sectional area of that trace. But you'll also notice down here, um, we have the capacitance, inductance, and propagation delay per um, unit length. And this is what the solver brings to the table. So now when we go into our design rules, um, if we're looking at match net lengths or um, overall length, um, you'll notice we can um, do delay tuning as well as length tuning. So you don't have to think that through anymore. Um, just basically um, enter Ooh. your matched delay in terms of units of time. Um, another thing in here too as well that will be helpful to you in your HDI design, um, basically defining your via stacks. Now I've got a couple of solutions here to get from top to bottom. I've got some micro vias and then a buried via. Um, when you're scoping this in the rules, let's go to uh, routing. Um, you'll notice that we've added to the query language um, is blind via as well as is micro via, okay, or is buried via. And so um, you can target those various technologies when you're coming up with the geometry of those views. Now, when I'm actually using this, let's go uh, top layer here. Route something. Uh, if I could hit something with a mouse. Uh, da, da, da. So I've got two solutions to get me from the top to the bottom. Now, um, it's going to default to the microvia stack, but I can also use a hotkey. In this case, it's the sixth key to toggle through the different via stacks. And if I could, um, let me get down here to the bottom layer. And I'll just go top to bottom again. Control key. Now, when I've got a um, layer stack like this, you, you guys are familiar with the color coding, but this is actually showing me that this is going from top to bottom, and then with each via, it shows me um, each via in that uh, microvia stack. 
now. Yeah, that is. I'll show you that here in just a minute. Well, we'll look at this in 3D here in just a second. Get back over here. Um, uh, well, wait a second here. Let's just look at it in um, 3D. Oh, is that a voltage? Say that again. Is it a voltage signal? Oh, this. You saying is that a voltage signal? Yeah, it's like three point three volts. Oh. Well, no, but that's fine. Um, yeah. It's still going to use then, um, I, I've got the two solutions from top to bottom. I've either got the through hole or the um, buried via with the micro via stack. And again, I can toggle between those on a hotkey. And you can take, you know, this, um, like what Mike was showing, you can drag that buried via stack off to the side. And it'll actually put traces in there and keep all mm -hmm. of that connected for you. I encourage you setting up rules too to make sure that you're not stacking on top of other ones. Is there, is there any way to automate it so we just stack them all the way down? Yeah, you can make a via profile, right? All the way through uh, the board? Yes and no. Now, what you can do is you can um, grab the individual vias and drag them out and make kind of a crankshaft style. Right, um, right now, and in, with the release of 20, we're not going to be able to define that as a via stack and reuse it, but that is on the roadmap. You, you can kind of cut and paste it, though, you, right? Yeah, you can yeah. cut and paste that. So that's what I've seen, it right. And, you know, right. No, but that is coming. Well, we got a few minutes left. Is there any other questions you guys would like to think about? Yeah. Um, this is spread out between 19 and 20. Um, uh, one thing, I'll, another thing I'll point out that is new to 20 is um, got a new design rule for your return path to make sure that um, Ooh. you have a pull in from your reference plane. Huh. And you'll notice that there are um, several settings here. Um, this exclude via voids, that is the source via that the signal is coming from. Um, but if this goes over any other, um, like, um, pullbacks in the plane due to vias and things, it'll catch that as well. You can define the um, minimum clearance between the edge of your return path or your reference and the trace, and it'll catch anything that um, isn't covered. Can you associate <laughs> specific nets oh, yeah. to that well, return? This, this is for this uh, DDR4 DM0. Yeah. Let's, um, let's just run that rule and look at it. Yeah, I mean, R Rick had this discussion in his, his thing about, you know, uh, routing over a power plane, and he showed you how it is, is, is acceptable and palatable to do, perhaps not preferred. Um, I really take that not preferred strongly, and simply because people tend to route other signals from different voltages in through that domain. And that's normal routing. So I just don't like setting myself up to do that. So if we get to the point where you can say you can route only if you're associated via a net, that has some strength. Um, and it also makes the assumption, as Rick brought out, that it's a tightly coupled plane. If it's a floating voltage plane, I'm not a fan of it. I just don't like them, period. Shouldn't be there in the first place, exactly. So um, 
I'm just such a fan of routing it over zero volts. I mean, every signal is driven at voltage reference to zero. So it'll best perform. Who's ever seen a coax with a power plane hooked up to it? Right? right? I mean, it's, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, right? <laughs> so this is basically um, the uh, signal path that's got the errors. You'll notice that um, it's um, leaving its reference plane here and in here. And so um, it found multiple areas where that net um, oh, yeah. is not being referenced to its um, Return uh, path. Return yeah. path. Nice. <clears throat> this is 20. Yeah. We also added a creepage rule as well. Awesome. Well, with that being said, thank you, Chris, and thank you all very much for attending. Thank you.